Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord, just for an opportunity to gather together and fellowship with you and with one another. And Lord, now we open your word and just ask that you would continue to teach us through this great story, Lord. Just, and I know I, I, I kind of made a statement, I think Sunday, about calling things stories. And yet, of all the books that you have, Lord, this is the most story-like, I think. But Lord, we know it to be true. We know it to be actual events. And Lord, we know it's as current today for us as it was then. And so, Lord, we just open your word. We yield to your spirit's purposes here tonight, Lord. And we just ask that you would teach us and help us to find application for our lives in your word. And so, we yield now. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can turn with me to chapter 5. I tell you, it was so tempting. I just kind of read all the way to the end again. And it was just really tempting to just read to the end tonight. It's just such, it just flows so well. It doesn't need much commentary. But I think the Lord has us in a place where we need to see some of the things that are maybe buried a little bit deeper. Now, when we finished chapter 4, we had seen that uh, Haman had brought this great charge, really trumped up charge against the Jewish people, and he was going to have them killed. They drew lots, or the Purim, the Pur, um, is what it was called, drawing lots for that day. It would be almost a year from the time that they drew the lot as to when they would be wiped out. So the Lord allowed a lot of time for things to take place before that day came. And there was this conversation between the now queen Esther and her uncle Mordecai about the things that were going to transpire and Mordecai was encouraging her with her position within the palace being the queen to the king that had put out this decree with the inspiration of Haman that she would have some role in doing something to possibly stop this great tragedy and so I just before we move into chapter 5 just to remind us there at the end of chapter 4 Beginning in verse 13, Mordecai is counseling Esther. And he says to her, he says, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, so he was speaking truth to her. I don't know if he thought she didn't realize this, but it was something she needed to realize, that she was in as much danger as a Jew than all of her brothers and sisters, all of her countrymen and countrywomen. And that famous question that comes from his statement, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we talked about last week, we all have a place in God's plan. We're all in the place that we're at for such a time as this. We may not know exactly what he's doing with each of us and in this time, but the fact that we're here and the fact that we belong to him, there's a, there's a reason. There's something that he's doing, and we need to keep our eyes open and be prayerfully asking what that would be so we don't miss the opportunity. And he goes on, he says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, and really, as I get into these words of verse 16, we just see such wisdom, I believe, on the part of Esther. And I wonder if this was her normal habit, if it was the habit of her people, if they were just well-versed in doing what she now says they should do. Verse 16, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. And so again, in her wisdom, she brings them to a point to do something really in, in obedience um, and, and really just laying down all the things that might distract them from hearing clearly what the Lord would have. And so much so was she dedicated to this that she even says, if I perish, I perish. She's willing to let her life go in order to bring about what needs to be brought about. But it is interesting that previously, just a couple verses ago, you know, Mordecai told her, you have this opportunity because God's put you in a pla this place at this time. But understand, you may perish 
with everyone else if this doesn't turn around. But he also put in there, but you know, if you don't do this, the Lord's going to raise someone up to do this. So here's your opportunity. And I know some of us could probably testify to the times the Lord maybe asked or prompted, nudged us to do something, and we didn't. But then we watched and watched it be done by someone else. And in that sense, someone else got the blessing we may have had. You know, and God's plans will go forth. God will find someone to do what he's asking. So we have the privilege of being obedient to those times where we're called to do something. Now, you know, the fact that she asked them not just to pray, but to fast, I think is really significant. You know, you might recall in, in Mark chapter 9 when the disciples were trying to help a father with a child who was possessed. And they were unsuccessful in getting the demon out. And there's many lessons in that great story. And we know that Jesus was coming about down off of the Mount of Transfiguration. He wasn't with them in that current time when they were trying to do this ministry. And he returns to be with them and he finds this situation. And after he... Jesus ministers to them and he drives out the demon and he addresses the father they go into a house and then they have a small conversation and in Mark chapter 9 verse 28 it says when he had come into the house his disciples asked him privately why could we not cast it out and Jesus said to them this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting and so I don't know if Esther had that kind of discernment that what was being asked at that point for this great tragedy that was on the horizon, that if they didn't fast and only prayed, they wouldn't be successful. And, you know, we kind of run by that, that instruction of Jesus there, saying this kind. And it is so specific that I want us to at least pay attention to it for this moment. You know, that word kind in Mark 9, verse 29, in the Greek, that word kind denotes a family. It speaks of kindred. It speaks of offspring. It speaks of parentage. And so when Jesus said this kind, he meant specifically there was something about this kind of demon that really had to be addressed in such a manner. And, and I find that interesting, and I, and I think it really prompts us to always be listening to the Lord's voice in every situation that we might have to address evil. What am I dealing with, Lord? What am I dealing with so that I know how I should pray? And then in certain situations, if we're listening carefully, he may say to us, this one is only going to come out by prayer and fasting. I mean, I don't think it's ever a bad habit. I don't think it's ever the wrong thing to do, that you would fast and pray. Um, I think the two going together is a powerhouse um, of empowering now, you may recall that this Haman, this evil character in our story, he was an Agagite. We talked about that last week. And that made him a descendant of the kings of the Amalekites. Because Agag was, or Agag was a actual royal title. So he came in lineage right from the kings of the Amalekites. So we might ask of or about Haman, what kind of was Haman what was his parentage what was his lineage and we know that the Amalekites the Lord had declared perpetual war against Amalek amongst their other crimes Amalek was the first one to attack the Israelites upon their exodus in from Egypt and their attacks then continued through much of the early Old Testament and really, it was their hatred for the Jews that eventually led to their ultimate doom. So I just wanted to bring that parallel, because I think there is a parallel. And I think somehow God empowered Esther to see that this kind, that spirit that came down through the Amalekites, that evil, needed to be dealt with with both fasting and praying. And I just want us to see it as a specific thing and not just, oh, you know, she decided, well, this was probably a good thing to do. I think it was very specific. I think it was her sensitivity to the Lord's leading. I think it was her spiritual discernment that made her understand. And again, I bring that up because I want us in our warfare, in our spiritual warfare, to understand that, that we need to go to 
our commanding officer and make sure that we understand the orders that he's given us in each mission that we're given, that we would know how to proceed. Because although I, I, I would never say any prayer it wouldn't be good enough, but how much better is specific prayer? How much better is specific instructions on what you're facing? I mean, sometimes I think we enter into warfare, sometimes not knowing it, other times knowing it, but not really taking the time to prepare. We, 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 we rush in when we could take a, a little bit of time to, to read our orders and see what is it I, I'm being asked to do and, and make sure we understand the instructions clearly and understand that this situation may be different than the last. And so we have to have a sensitivity to the Lord's voice. We need to purposely seek Him and His instructions for each situation, I believe. Now, the Amalekites' fate... I believe ultimately was an example of how attempts to put God's plans out of order or to curse God's people will always be overturned. It may not come immediately. There may be a defeat followed by victory, but ultimately his plans will always happen. They will always be fulfilled. And in, in the case of the Jewish people, we go back to the promise that was given to Abraham for them. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Got all kinds of problems with my microphone tonight. In Genesis 12, verse 3, God promised, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, if you think that that's just a sweet saying of the Lord, then I would say study history. In particular, study the United States history, even in recent times, the last few decades. There's a track record of every time that our country has taken a move, made a decision, or stepped some way adversely against Israel. Some calamity has come against the United States. There's an extremely boring book out there called uh, Eye for an Eye, and I can't think of the author's name. And... and, and um, if you decide to read it someday, I could get you the authors. I think it's on my bookshelf at home. You're going to have to do it with a lot of coffee. Um, it's, it's one of the most boring books I've ever read. But, it, but it's historical events. And the one that always comes to mind, and I, and I shouldn't bring it up because I can't remember the decision our government made, but usually, in, in every case, let me backtrack, with, usually it's within six months. Within six months of every decision we've made adversely against Israel, there's a calamity in the United States. And I remember the one, and I can't remember what our decision was, but Hurricane Katrina was the one that came within six months. That was a pretty big one. Just a day ago, or within the last couple of days, Saudi Arabia made some move, put out some kind of thing against Israel. And it was interesting, I saw today, they had the, the largest, I didn't even know they had them in that country, but they had the largest ever recorded tornado that just spurred up like within 48 hours of what the prince did. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but God's serious. And if, yes, this is Israel, but as believers in Jesus as your Savior, you're grafted in. You're grafted into that same promise. You don't replace Israel, you're not Israel. And I have to emphasize that because there's people that teach otherwise. You have that cover. You are God's people. It's quite a lead in. Chapter 5, <laughs> verse 1. It says, Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes, this would be after the time of prayer and fasting, and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Remember, what she was trying to do without being sequestered to that court or to the, to the throne room was really against all the rules. She risked her own death. Um, but she did it with some tact. She stayed outside that immediate vicinity until he put the scepter forth, which was the only way you were welcomed in. 
So again, after that fast was completed, she dresses appropriately. She approaches the king as close as she can. can, And the king recognized that it had to be something very important, whatever matter she had on her mind, to come and do what she did. And he was gracious enough to invite her in. And then he promises to grant her request. Up to half the kingdom, we see. Now, as literal as that could be, we also need to realize that that was just a figure of speech. It was a figure of speech that basically meant he would give her anything within reason, is what that, is what that the common saying meant. But she really demonstrated what I would call true courage in her willingness to appear before the king without being summoned by him. And I think it took a special courage when you think about this particular king. Because if you remember where we've been just in the previous chapters, this king doesn't have a great reputation for treating his queens well. Um, so she, she had a risk all around. Let's pick up with verse 4. So Esther, Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this. If I have found favor in your sight, in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So she simply invites the king, his favorite minister, Haman, to the banquet. And during the meal, the king again tries to get out of her what she wants. What is this request? Why she approached him. And she procrastinates. And she asks the king to return the next day with Haman to another banquet. And she says that then she'll make the request known. Now, there's varying opinions as to why she hesitated. Why didn't she just say some of the thoughts that float out there are she wanted time to ingratiate herself with the king because apparently she'd kind of fallen out of favor with him, it appears. He had not summoned her once in the previous 30-some days. And so possibly she was trying to ingratiate herself with him again. Possibly her courage failed her each time that she tried to say what she wanted. Some have guessed that maybe she wanted to build up an element of suspense impress upon the king that her business was vitally important and not just coming to him on a whim. And another thing that I, I saw a commentator say is she wanted to initiate or inflate, excuse me, Haman's pride and take him off guard before she exposed him as a vicious murderer. Perhaps each of those elements involved in her thinking. We can't know for sure, but it was probably a bit of each or a bit of some. Let's pick up in verse 9. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when he saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife, Shuress. Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Haman was indeed a miserable man. He's honored by both the king and the queen of Persia, the largest empire on the earth at the time. But the disapproval of this one man makes him feel worthless. So he's got this deep-seated insecurity that's being witnessed here. So Haman meets Mordecai on the way out of the palace. He's filled with this indignation He's restrained, fortunately, from doing violence. And then he does this, what I find kind of humorous. He calls his friends and his wife together and he recites all the favorable things that had happened to him. I mean, he had a serious need to be honored by everybody. 
And that meant that he could never truly be happy. Maybe you have tried to satisfy everybody, make everybody happy. There's no way. But then we have the challenge of making ourselves happy, of satisfying ourselves. I think everybody has some hunger more than, in some than others, but everyone has a hunger for acceptance. But you know, I believe God put that into us so that ultimately the way that we would get that filled is by finding Jesus. That we would find our ultimate acceptance, our ultimate definition of who we are in Him. So I believe He puts that place in us of hunger for that acceptance so that we would be driven to him. But along the way, we aren't much different than Haman trying to get everybody else to appreciate us. But, you know, instead of wrestling with that need, we just need to be reminded that the scripture tells us that as believers, we are accepted, it tells us, in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. That means we're accepted before God because of who we are in Jesus. Listen to these words that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and following. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, listen, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So we don't need to really have others accept us. We don't really need to try to feed that need to be accepted if we know who we belong to, who, who, who is the one who is, has accepted us. Be accepted by him really negates all the rest. Look at verse 14. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. This is an extreme jump in my mind of all the things they could have come up with. A gallows. Just, I don't know. It did, maybe it was a popular thought. It just seemed pretty extreme. So to them, it wasn't just enough to punish Mordecai's people or to just merely kill Mordecai. They wanted Haman to ask for a public, humiliating execution of Mordecai on a gallows that would be 75 feet in height. Pretty extreme. And so it pleased Haman, he had the gallows made, and it seems by this way the story goes very quickly. And I'd say, well, so what's the lesson here? Well, I believe the lesson is never underestimate the destructive power of hatred. Hatred can move amazingly fast, it can move powerfully, it can involve others. It's a dangerous weapon. But this irrational, violent hatred that made Haman want to see Mordecai die upon the gallows is the same irrational, violent hatred that hung Jesus on the cross. You know, I think it's interesting what hate leads to. You know, hate's listed in our scripture as a work of the flesh. And in particular, where that great list of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 is listed, I've always had a theory, and I'll call it that because... I can't say I'm absolutely correct. But I've always had a theory when I read those three verses in Galatians chapter 5 that lists the work of the flesh, I don't think it's an arbitrarily ordered list. I think you, I can make a great case that that list actually is a list of escalation. And it's interesting, when you go through the list, when you get to hatred... You only go a couple more steps before you get to murder. And so it doesn't surprise me that the works of the flesh in this man Haman are so great. Matter of fact, let me read you that list. Verse 19 of chapter 5 of Galatians. 
It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. And I'll stop right there, because the first two are adultery and fornication. So right away, you, someone might read this list in a shallow manner and say, well, I don't have to worry about that because I've never committed adultery and I've never fornicated. Well, I believe we can see this as works of the flesh because that's what it says, but there's always a spiritual application. And the place that even a believer can be guilty of adultery, not necessarily from their marriage, but in their relationship to the Lord himself. Because we are bound by a fidelity to our husband, the Lord, as his bride. And so the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, and if we trip through those first two, we end up unclean. Uncleanliness, or uncleanness is that next one. Lewdness, it would just follow. Idolatry, we start going further and further after the things that aren't God. Sorcery takes place, which in the New Testament speaks of, wiz- of wizardry, but it also speaks of pharmacia. Drug use, alcohol. And then we get to that point of hatred. And then hatred it just messes up the mind. It's, it's a firestorm of the mind and the emotions leading to contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy. Do we see that in this man for the other? And then murder. Murder. And then more drunkenness, revelries, and the like, it tells us, because that list goes on. So I just bring that up because I think Haman is a great example of those works of the flesh, that escalation if not tamed by the Holy Spirit. That's where it can end up. And that's often why we say that line about, if not for the grace of God, there go I. Because every one of us has these capabilities in our flesh. We may never think that we could get there and how privileged we are to have found the Lord. Because without Him, all those things become increasingly possible. It's also why Jesus encourages us to die to our flesh, to die to ourselves so that we don't wrestle with those things, to kill our members on the earth, he says. Let's pick up in verse 1 of the next chapter, verse chapter 6. It says, that night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Asuras. And the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So now we have this picture, Haman sleeping, and God's at work. And again, I've said it many times, I'll probably keep saying it, just the beauty of this book. God mentioned nowhere, but we see him in every step forward in this story. He kept the king awake, I believe, in order to unravel this evil scheme that's taking place. Now, the king did what a lot of people do when they can't sleep. He brought out a book. And in this case, probably a pretty boring one. And he was going to use it to fill this sleepless night, hoping that reading it would have him fall asleep. But by divine coincidence, the portion that was read contained the account of the attempt on his own life, which had been foiled by Mordecai himself. So upon inquiry, he learns that nothing had ever been done to award or reward Mordecai for what he had done. Now, this is really kind of a rare display of concern by a king for a common subject, asking what honor or dignity had been bestowed on this Mordecai. Now, this book of the records of the Chronicles, as it's listed here, that the king called for, it's literally a book of remembrance. And that's the job that it did that night. He remembered that someone had spoiled a plot against him. And he was able then to inquire about this man. And it's interesting to note that God also has a book of remembrance. And he talks about it in the very final book of the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 16. There it says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Kind of reminds us of that book of the life, book of life that we're written into when we come into that saving relationship with Jesus. And I'd just like to point out there that was Malachi 3, 
16. If you ever want to do a really interesting study in Scripture, do a study of 316. It's amazing how many things land on 316. It's, it's uh, just a, I'm entertained by it every time I see another one. Not that any verse is less important, but there's just something special about 316. Look at verse 4. So the king said, who is in the court? This is just like a really good sitcom now. So who's, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court, and the king said, let him come in. Now, of course, it's no coincidence that Haman enters the king's court at just that moment. But isn't it interesting, we're standing out here reading this story. So we get to see this from an insider's point of view. We're getting to see this from the Holy Spirit's point of view because he wrote this. But how many times are we in situations where we don't notice this? Who we pass, who we come upon, who comes by us and comes upon us. Who's in that situation, that place where we're at? And we have no idea that God's working out something that we just can't see. Now sometimes I believe we miss it because we're not looking for it. Sometimes we get the privilege of having seen it, but it's usually down the road and we look back with hindsight and say, that was the Lord. That was God. I think those things are happening a whole lot more often than we know. Now this book of Esther shows us that God manages the affairs of men even without their knowledge. He definitely doesn't need our help, even though he joins with us in his efforts. And the truth is, God knows what he's doing. Because in the courts of heaven, there are no coincidences. There's no surprises. And I saw this by a commentator. He said, Esther wasn't lucky to be queen. Mordecai wasn't lucky to have overheard the assassination plot. It wasn't luck or chance that made Haman enter the royal courts at this time with this heart. All of these events were orchestrated by God and not by luck. Now, I know that this all becomes difficult, what we just talked about, about God being in charge, God not being surprised, God ordaining things that happen. And I know that it becomes difficult when bad things happen to us. It's not real hard to understand God's managing things when we see good things happen. But what about the bad thing? Well, just like the good, the bad things require our trust. And that's so important that even in those tough times and tribulations and trials, that we remain trusting in the Lord. We've got to trust in God and his complete, total plan. I think it's so important for us to know that we get snippets. We see pieces. We experience something and think it's everything when it's likely just a part of what's going on. We need to realize, like Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now pay attention. Paul said, all things work together. So any one event taken by itself, it, it may seem to make no sense or seem, and I don't like to even use the word, but it may seem unfair, too difficult. But when we see all things working together, then we see the ultimate wisdom of God's plan. But we don't know how long it might take to know how this event fits or how that really could have been possibly worked out for good. But for those that love good or love God, good things will come from whatever situation we're in when we get to see the whole plan unfold. And I know in the middle of difficult times, it's tough because our eyes are just focused on that one thing. It's kind of like when you're if, if you were ever to do a scientific study on something, 
If you know anything about scientific studies, one of the most important things about a scientific study is the sample size. The sample size. What do I mean by sample size? How many, how many times did you do that thing and measure it? How many people did you interview or watch or observe or, or, or test? Because if the sample size is too small, we don't know anything. There was a famous statistician who said, measure once, you know everything. Measure twice, you know nothing. You need to have a large enough sample size. And so when we see one thing happen, we can't measure. We don't know anything at that point. We just know what's happening in that moment. And that's when we need to look up. And we need to realize, okay, I don't know how this fits in some great plan. And I certainly don't want to go through this. And I certainly don't understand why I'm going through this. But the fact is, I love God. And therefore, he's going to work this out for good. And I know it's easy to say standing outside a difficult time. And I'm not trying to make light of it. Verse 6, so Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man who the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Now it's another truth about God is he often allows fallen men to set up their own trap. And here God allows Haman to make his pride and arrogance be the cause of for his ultimate humiliation. Look at verse 7. And Haman answered the king, I would love to see him. For the man whom the king delights to honor, I wonder if he was pointing to himself, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. And let this robe and the horse be delivered to the hand of the one the king's most noble princes that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Well, he was thinking that his own great moment had come. And he suggests this really elaborate parade and he's asking to have things bestowed on him, he thinks, that really are only second to those things that are done for the king himself but he's being guided by childish desires. And Haman's seeking to be praised and honored by all. He's back to that again. And really, if you look at it and you consider that list, we see his shallowness because he asked for things that really matter very little. Haman, again, I call a tragic man. Because he really believed that he had to hear the applause of men to know that he had done well. And it was the only thing that was going to fulfill him. Look at verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai. Oh, I just want a snapshot of his face. And do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe, probably like this, and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king delights to honor. Man, could you imagine that? I would love to have watched him as he took the king's advice, as he gave honor to his arch enemy, the very man that Haman came seeking to execute was now his to honor. Verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all the friends of everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. So now Haman's deflated. He retreats to his house and he reports these strange developments, not to be built up, not to be encouraged. His wife and his wise friends saw in the day's events an omen of victory for the Jew 
and defeat for Haman. But by then we're told that Haman gets hurried off by the eunuchs to the next banquet by Esther. Like I said, I really consider just reading through the rest of the book, but we'll let it hang there till next week. One of the things I wanted to point out that I didn't notice in other times through this book, and I didn't find it out, I read it through a commentary, <clears throat> and we normally think of these gallows as some place that a person would be hung. And yet it seems that in those days they would build what they called gallows. And um, try not to be too graphic, but they would actually impale the person on a spike. Let me just say somewhere between their legs all the way up through the neck. And um, that was actually the method of torture and death that was on those gallows. And that's so much hanging as we would consider it. So I didn't look much further into that, but uh, that's what was described by one old commentator. So something uh, pretty vicious, pretty cruel, but it's what Haman wanted for Mordecai, and now what he'll probably find for himself. So we'll rest there and get into the rest of this.